Time Magazine says you're conspiracy theorists. That's right, the magazine that you last perused over a decade ago while waiting for a dental filling has done their part in the multifaceted legacy media deflection of blame away from offshore wind developers for the mid-Atlantic carnage of the last couple months. Maybe they've settled the issue, we're gonna see. After all, the scientists they quote from a neutral conservation group who doesn't think these whale deaths are anything to worry about was also out there back in November saying this. As a member of an organization that has responded to these animals washing up on our shores for decades, we support development of wind energy. Yeah, I don't see any conflict of interest there. Everything looks ship shape. Let's start reading the story. In mid-January, threatening social media messages started showing up on the accounts of a small New Jersey organization devoted to rescuing ocean mammals that wash up on the beach. Some said, we're watching you. Others accused staff of the Marine Mammal Stranding Center, MMSC, of being whale murderers. Right off the bat, notice that the narrative being crafted here is not going to shine a spotlight on the elephant in the room. They're not painting a picture of the companies we all suspect is the culprit in these whale deaths. No, they're instead framing this as the public is just outraged at the kindly volunteers of an animal rescue center. We'll get more into that, but from the get-go, this is not what I or any of the sources I've quoted in covering this has said. None of the informed activists who have been working to get the word out on offshore wind have called the employees of Brigantine's Marine Mammal Stranding Center whale murderers. Whoever sent them that message was ill-informed. The two sides of this issue they want you to see are a particular volunteer group that cares for stranded whales, and on the other side is a bunch of maniacs who are accusing these folks of insane things. Do you want to protect your ocean from devastating offshore wind pollution? You're the villain, and the Marine Mammal Stranding Center is the victim. I don't want to belabor it, but it's important from a communication standpoint to see that we've totally reoriented the situation so that the energy companies, whose activities we want investigated, they've just ducked out of the room and they're not part of this at all. And now on center stage are online trolls bothering the poor little old ladies at Marine Mammal Stranding Center. Back to the story, some people wrote they were going to show up at the group's Brigantine, New Jersey headquarters and make members of the wildlife organization come to their side. You don't know what they're gonna do, says Michelle Pagel, 49, the group's assistant director. Are they gonna march in here and put a gun to somebody's head? <laughs> Death threats with guns. We didn't go there, we being the people who oppose what the energy companies are doing. You went there, you brought that up, Michelle, you made that speculation. And I do think it's irresponsible to characterize the folks whose natural resources are getting confiscated from them as gun-wielding psychos. No one's done that, no one should do that, I don't know anyone in this movement who would even dream of doing that. And maybe you didn't think the reporter would use this quote, but I really don't think you should have made that speculation. Again, I'm sorry to take so long on the first paragraph, but we're not even through it, and people who don't want offshore wind have just been painted as potential mass shooters. It's maybe just a little extreme. Back to the story, staff members contacted local police and they started locking the doors to the group's office. In late January, someone left the door unlocked and a man burst into the office and approached the secretary. He just starts yelling, I want to know, I demand to know, says Sheila Dean, 75, the group's director. He was very frightening. Now this is the worst thing that's actually happened they can point to. A man came to their office and yelled in a threatening tone. That's terrible. I don't condone anyone doing that. I don't know anyone who wouldn't tell that guy to knock it off if we saw it happening. It's totally inappropriate. We don't know who this person was. We don't know what his affiliation was. But to be belligerent to an elderly woman, if it, if it was Sheila that he was yelling at, I'm not entirely sure from the way that's written if it was her or not. She's 75. No one should be yelling in her face. If the guy's entering her workplace, we, we don't want anyone who has that kind of poor judgment to be doing anything on behalf of communities trying to protect their coast from offshore wind clowns. And for all we know, it's a guy who belongs in a straitjacket. We don't know. Back to the story. Along with picking up sick baby seals and dolphins, the MMSC helps to carry out examinations on the bodies of dead whales when they wash up on the shores of New York and New Jersey in order to collect scientific data and hopefully help determine a cause of death. And in recent months, whales have been washing up on these shores with alarming frequency. Eight large whales, including sperm whales and humpbacks, have washed up in the area since December. 
those deaths have become a focal point in the clean energy culture war, with conservative media commentators blaming them on preliminary site mapping work for offshore wind developments. Now this is about as much info alluding to seismic activity as we're gonna get. It's not fleshed out at all. Really no background info to let anyone know why so many of us expect that some, or maybe all of these unexplained whale deaths that have been happening all over the place, not exclusively the Brigantine area, were contributed to by what offshore wind companies have been doing. If this is my introduction to the subject, I still don't have the basic info to grasp why anyone would be irate, why they'd be protesting offshore wind. They're just these nuts hassling this one group of older ladies who spend a few hours each week helping seals and whales. But conservative media commentators are blaming everything on, quote, preliminary site mapping. So that sounds like it must just be like a guy walking around scribbling things on a map. It sounds very gentle and innocuous, preliminary site mapping. I'm picturing graph paper, a protractor, a compass, not really getting a sense of constant low frequency sound capable of impacting whales in the vicinity and screwing with their senses. And also I have to point out, they say it's all conservatives. So that's reiterated again later multiple times too. I think it would be hilarious if everyone who is not a conservative would just leave a comment on this video. I'm not big on video comments. I rarely leave them. I don't often see them but I'm asking for it this time. Please chime in if the label conservative does not apply to you and you're concerned about offshore wind. Just as an experiment, I'm asking you to please consider leaving a quick comment. It could be just as simple as not a conservative. I'm guessing it could be roughly half of the people who oppose offshore wind. But according to time, if you're registered as a Democratic voter, green rainbow, independent or unenrolled like many of us, apparently you don't exist. Okay, conservative media commentators blaming whale deaths on preliminary site mapping work for offshore wind developments. But evidence to support those claims hasn't turned up. That's brought down the ire of many people opposed to offshore wind on small animal welfare organizations like MMSC for supposedly hiding the truth of what killed those whales. There's a sprinkle of truth here, but let me reiterate what we've actually said at its simplest level any data about whales that have beached beyond completely rudimentary details like it was a whale, it was dead, it was such and such feet long, has for some reason been classified by NOAA as being of a proprietary nature that will never be revealed to the public except in the event of a federal investigation. Only level B and C necropsy data would ever have a chance of determining the impact of seismic activity if there is any, and that data is apparently top secret. But the whole issue could be settled quickly if the government would just open the books and show us what they've got. But they seem to be intent on maintaining this shroud of secrecy around whale necropsies as if they're vital to our national security. Go figure. NOAA's Marine Mammal Stranding Network contains many, many more NGOs than just the Marine Mammal Stranding Center in Brigantine. I have never said that this group in Brigantine is a bad actor. There are other NGOs given equal authority in NOAA's Marine Mammal Stranding Network that fishing communities only would trust as far as they could throw them because those are NGOs that funnel a lot of money into anti-fishing activism. I don't have any reason to believe that the organization that Time picked to highlight in this story is one of them. Marine Mammal Stranding Center is probably staffed by people doing their very best. As the story will later mention, there are not a ton of donations available to fund their work. I get that. I really do. Surely they're doing the best they're able to, so let's put that aside. The work to actually examine those carcasses is grueling and tedious. And the story goes on to describe that the work is gross, necropsies are hard. I'm sure they are. It mentions that the federal government provides some of the funding for groups like MMSC, but you know, probably not enough. And I'll just say, if whales are going to be the catalyst to shut down whole communities worth of businesses, like in fishing, the government better pony up enough funding for the necropsies to determine whether whales died from ship strikes, entanglements, or something unseen like seismic activity. If a picture of a whale anywhere with any kind of rope around it is enough to pressure regulatory aggression against fisheries that don't even use that kind of rope, then guess what, Noah? You've at least got to be evaluating whether the government's own pet projects like offshore wind are killing any whales. Humpback whale strandings across the East Coast have been elevated for the past seven years. So is offshore wind development, by the way. We get a regurgitation of Noah's talking points that we've covered before. I won't go over it again. 
And I love this, as I teased at the beginning, we now go from the friendly whale volunteers and the offshore wind determined government agencies saying nothing to see here folks, to trustworthy neutral expert Rob, the chief scientist at the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. Marine conservation, that's what we're all about, sounds good. And he's here to say that maybe the whale population has just increased so much, the whales are doing so good that maybe this sudden outbreak of more than 20 whale deaths in a couple months of survey work is just totally normal. Really, the biggest question is, are we seeing more whale strandings or are we just seeing more whales and strandings are occurring, says Robert in the article. He's a professional conservationist, a chief scientist no less, and I guess he doesn't believe those deaths tie into offshore wind. So we just got debunked. Sorry I wasted your time. Oh hey, look at this commercial he was in last fall. One of the reasons why we support development in wind energy is so that we can have a better environment for the animals that we see traveling through our waters, such as whales, dolphins, seals, and sea turtles. Wow, according to Rob, offshore wind actually is good for whales. This is very comforting to learn. I wonder why the fact that he was personally doing marketing work for offshore wind wasn't disclosed by Time magazine. I mean, they quoted him as a conservationist. Ah, must have just been a one-time thing. By the way, there was a totally separate propaganda effort last year to try and talk residents into loving their offshore wind carpetbaggers. Why do we need offshore wind to fight climate change and what is happening uh, in the realm of offshore wind development? Offshore wind is a key component to fighting climate change on Long Island and throughout the state of New York. And exciting news is happening. Here in 2022, uh, the first offshore wind farm has started construction. That's called the South Fork Wind Farm, and that's off of the South Fork of Long Island. It's the smallest of five that are moving through the permitting and the regulatory process. In addition, there have been many more leases, six in this case, uh, that have been sold to other offshore wind companies throughout the globe that will be developing wind power for Long Island and New York State. Let me introduce you to this terrific panel uh, that we're gonna be talking to today. I don't know why I'm bringing it up. I don't think it has any bearing on the story. Well, speak of the devil, would you look who happened by the studio for that project? First on my left, we have Rob Diagiovanni. Rob is the uh, executive director and chief scientist of the Atlantic Marines Conservation Society. Next to him, we have Julie Tai, a woman who I've worked with for years now, who is the president of the New York League of Conservation Voters. And last, but absolutely not least, we have Carl LeBou, who's the New York Ocean's program director and a marine scientist with the Nature Conservancy. To me, you can look at a negative and say, where's the positive? And the positive is we can make a difference. We can make change. And, and that's, that's what we should be looking at, is that let's work together to try and implement those changes on all fronts, not, not just when we look at, at wind energy, but we can make differences in how we travel and, and what we do and, and making people more aware is a big part of this. So I thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's amazing what you're seeing where we have environmental groups working with energy groups, working with labor groups, working with the business community, because we all see that we need to move towards a green economy. It does all come back to economics, doesn't it? And the first step to helping all these organizations secure profits from offshore wind development is to lay out the idea that whales are just going to be dying and it has nothing to do with offshore wind. Again, this video was released 10 months ago, well before the recent post-seismic survey spike in whale deaths. In the changing environment that we have, we see whales on a regular basis. I mean, now we have whales that, that wash up on our shores for many reasons, that, uh, whether, whether it be entanglement, uh, fish strikes, or just natural causes. So those are things that we will continue to investigate, but they also come with you know, the, the um, bigger side that we have a number of animals that are out there. You know, you can go out and be out on the beach and you hear from almost, I don't want to say everybody because that's really, really bold, but more times than not, I'll have people say, instead of saying I had no idea whales were here, they say, oh, I was here the other day and I saw a whale offshore. Well, that's a changing environment. And is that good or bad? I mean, it's great that we're seeing them, but how is the habitat that they're feeding in how is that operating and is, is it, are we able to sustain these animals? So that's some things that we need to look at. How is that operating? 
Rob doesn't seem to have a clear idea, yet he's being quoted by Time Magazine and others as a whale expert floating this idea that whales are just around, closer to shore, following their feed, and so that's supposed to explain away why more and more of them are showing up mysteriously dead. He sounds very knowledgeable on this subject. You're right, we see so many more now. Mm -hmm. um, so how will wind farms impact that? Well, and that's a good question. So you can look at these animals, they move through areas, just like we have ships that are going through there. There's, there's always factors of noise, and does that um, change their behavior? Um, those are things that we really need to understand more readily, but it's also if they're coming up through these areas and they're following food and there's food around, you know, I I don't, I use very, very bad examples, but if you, you move the buffet from here to there, I'm going to follow the buffet. So in a case of, of animals, that they can move. It's really, does that impact their food source when they're going? And those are where, um, one of the benefits that I see that we have going on right now is that we're doing a lot more studies of our environment to understand what's happening with the fisheries, what's happening with with plankton, and what's happening with the, with the whale populations to see how those are interrelated. And it's a result of projects like this. Speaking of studies, everyone knows that when a special interest group funds a study, it can be with the goal of obtaining the result that will be the most advantageous for them. The study that guys like Rob keep referring to was produced a few years back by a group called Gotham Whale to establish this idea that more whales are living nearby and we shouldn't be surprised if they suddenly start dying nearby. But researcher Trevor Doyle noted recently that Gotham Whale says in the study that they worked together closely with the Nature Conservancy in putting that project together. TNC being a massive environmental NGO that is tied in with the offshore wind industry, shown here advertising them. And the funding for that study was procured by Clay Hiles, formerly of the New York League of Conservation Voters, also represented in this Offshore Wind infomercial, an organization which is a recipient of funds from Offshore Wind Corporation Orsted. So two out of three of the professional greenwashers shown in this Offshore Wind infomercial have interesting connections to the whale study being sourced to turn attention away from the whale impacts of offshore wind development. CNN recently ran a story about this study that was pushing the claim that whale experts have debunked the idea that offshore wind has anything to do at all with the recent whale deaths, yet not mentioning the curious ties to the offshore wind industry from Gotham Whale's funding stream and collaborators. Just interesting stuff to note. Thank you, Trevor, for pointing that out. We need to uh, see these projects move forward. As a representative on the New York State's uh, Offshore Wind uh, Environmental Working Group, I'm often on panels like this where the discussion is around the potential impacts of offshore wind development on marine life. And that's a really important subject. But in that context, we sometimes lose the perspective of what the impacts of climate change is already having on marine life, which is really a, a big driver of why we need to uh, see these projects move forward. Why is your organization, LCV, why do you, besides for state policy, which now it's mandated, why do you think offshore wind has to be part of the mix to fight climate change? How serious do you think the climate crisis is? Well, the climate crisis is without doubt the worst, the, the, the biggest crisis we are all facing as a, as a country. It's an exact existential threat to the entire world. We know that air pollution causes major respiratory ailments, uh, and there's something that we can do to take action on that. Clean energy doesn't have any air impacts. So that is like a huge public health factor. So to us, this is a top priority. We need every level of government to be taking action uh, because it's going to require federal government investments and support, like what we've seen with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, making more lands available in the, the New York Bight, which is the area between Montauk and Cape May, New Jersey, right, yes. Carl? Carl's the, the expert here on this. Um, <laughs> that's going to make a lot more wind available. It also is putting it critically close to the areas of the population centers so that you're not, that where it's very difficult to put in clean energy otherwise, right? New York City does not have room for acres and acres of solar wind, of the solar power, or for big wind farms. So we need the ocean being much closer to that. It makes it a lot easier than uh, otherwise. We, we need both. Like, we're going to need power from upstate New York, we're going to need hydropower, we're going to need solar power, but having the offshore wind close to those population density centers where we're using so much energy really is a, a critical factor and allows us to also get folks from, uh, you know, from our cities 
also involved in the jobs associated with right. that. So right. it's public health, it's environment, it's jobs. Right. And I think that's a really good point I want to make is that sometimes people say to me all the time, well, you know, I really don't want anything in the ocean. And I say, I agree. I mean, I would love if we lived in a world where we didn't have to put any structures in the ocean, but we're not there anymore. It's up to us to choose that infrastructure that has the least impact on the environment. And that is offshore wind. And that's one of the reasons I think it's very important to continue to advance this technology as part of our energy mix. If we had done this, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. And obviously, Adrian, you and you, New York League of Conservation Voters and Citizens Campaign for the Environment, we've been trying to help educate the public about the potential impacts and about the fact that wind energy is coming so that, that the general public has the opportunity to ask questions of scientists, like you, like both of yourselves have been on some of our forums that we've had, some of our educational forums, also of the developers who are doing these projects, so that there's an opportunity for a dialogue and to help address the concerns that people have and to help provide good information. Because all too often there are people who are reliant on, you know, bad information or misinformation, not on purpose, but just because they don't know. And we're trying to make sure that they're informed about the potential impacts and what's being done to prepare check them. And to your point earlier, right, there's going to have, we're going to have to have energy come from somewhere. <laughs> right. That's right? right. It's coming from somewhere. We're going to need more of it. We're not going to have less of it. Um, that's not where our, our universe is going, although we would like everyone to be more energy efficient uh, with what's out there. But I think really sort of providing the opportunity for people to, to understand is a, is a critical role and some one that we're going to learn too, you know, as we move forward and keep providing that information to the public. So certainly keep an eye out for those public education forms. Absolutely. So keeping that in mind, the time story continues. Another theory has been circulating online and on conservative talk shows <laughs> that the offshore wind industry, which has been conducting work off the coast of New York and New Jersey as it prepares to install massive wind turbines, is responsible for the whale deaths. Some New Jersey politicians have called for a moratorium on offshore wind work until it can be ruled out as a cause of the whale deaths, though there's no evidence to support claims that wind development has anything to do with the whales washing up, according to federal fisheries experts. There is no evidence to suggest that there is offshore wind activity that is linked to any of these whale deaths. Despite that lack of evidence, some conservative news commentators have implied that there could be a conspiracy by scientists to hide the offshore wind industry's supposed role in whale deaths. Such comments are echoed on community anti-wind power Facebook groups. I find that last bit pretty funny coming right on the heels of time bringing in a so-called scientist to shake his head furiously that there's nothing fishy about these whale deaths on his one-off day from doing sales presentations for offshore wind corporations. I mean, that's just rich. But they keep saying it's conservatives who are stirring this up. Conservative pundits. They mention Newsmax. They don't mention Fox News in this, but of course Tucker Carlson's show has run the most widely seen cable news stories on this issue. Those are conservative pundits, true. Their audiences skew right. If a network whose audience skews left would cover this issue, I think most of us would be all too glad to share it around. For some reason, only networks like Newsmax and Fox have been the ones covering this story so far in a way that critically examines the impact of offshore wind. If Time or CNN or someone else wants to look at all the facts and characterize what we've been saying adequately, by all means, go for it. And why is it that Clean Ocean Action has been one of the major voices against offshore wind in New York and New Jersey? They're definitely not a group anyone would call a conservative attack dog, and their work isn't even mentioned in this story. Why are they ignored? MMSC is in the crosshairs of the clean energy culture war, with staff at the small organization bombarded with hostile messages and phone calls from locals and people around the country, incised by their supposed role in a cover-up. Webster's Dictionary defines incised as cut in, engraved, especially decorated with incised figures, having a margin that is deeply and sharply notched, an incised leaf. I assume the author meant to use the word incensed, or they have a radical new use for the word incised that I'm not smart enough to get. 
but I'll assume it's a typo. I mean, you know, it's only Time Magazine. They can't afford to be proofreading their stories when multinational offshore wind developers need their help stat to put the flames out on their disastrous business plans. By the way, Time Magazine also suggested that I might like to read this article. They wrote about how the vineyard wind offshore turbines could be a lifeline for struggling New England cities. Back to the story. We understand that they are upset and saddened by these whale deaths, says Pagel. We are too. But there's humans on the other end of MMSC's social media accounts and the emails and the phones. The group's headquarters doesn't exactly betray much in way of connection to powerful offshore energy interests. MMSC is based out of a collection of small buildings off a busy road in Brigantine. There's a small, cluttered office, a building with a small pool of piped-in bay water for holding injured dolphins and seals, and a one-room museum housing various bones and whale parts that the group has collected. <laughs> How many diminutive adjectives can we throw in here? Small. Cluttered. It's just a club of jolly senior citizens puttering around a shop, working on whale hummel figurines, and handing out freshly baked cookies to neighborhood children. We get it. The people affiliated with Brigantine's Marine Mammal Stranding Center are probably delightful, and those employed in a professional capacity are undoubtedly thoroughly professional. However, NOAA's necropsy protocol needs to be reformed, level B and C data needs to be collected and revealed at this point since whales are dying left and right and there's no other way to ascertain what role the seismic activity has in these deaths. Back to the story, the offshore wind companies did offer to provide some funding in recent years, how kind of them, but Dean says she turned them down. The turbines are controversial in this area, some people fear the turbines will harm the environment. That's just a fear, a totally irrational fear, I'm sure. Or tank coastal housing prices. And she didn't want to appear to be biased towards the developers. Well, that's good. Not that they couldn't have used the cash. Everybody's underpaid here, says Dean. I keep hoping I win the lottery so I can pay everyone what they're due. Can I just point out, we're almost to the end of the story, and Time Magazine is still vociferously defending this one little animal rescue center that I've never accused of anything. Brigantine Marine Mammal Stranding Center is not who we've been railing against, but you'd think they were if you're only getting this from the story. Time still hasn't laid out any of the details about the ways that offshore wind development can harm whales or other marine life, nor any of the many organizations that offshore wind companies have successfully funneled money into. They're not talking about that, they're just defending this one group we haven't accused of anything. Now here's the most substantial effort in the whole story to dismantle what I've been harping on, and what many of you have been getting the word out about. So much so that they need to do their best to call us out. But, if their response was so good, I'd think they would have led with it, instead of burying it at the very bottom of the article. I'll read it now. One specific claim made by some anti-wind advocates is that scientists are refusing to examine the dead whale's inner ears which they say could show lesions indicating damage from sonar systems used by offshore wind mapping crews. I like that, they're, they're mapping crews now. I like that new term for the seismic activity. They're just mapping crews. That's not quite what we've said, but it's close. We've been talking about the low frequency sound from the seismic boomers they're using. And I'm not saying that scientists refuse to examine whales' inner ears. I'm saying that NOAA has provided no necropsy protocol that would require it, and if any such evidence is gathered, the government agency refuses to reveal it. Asked about those accusations, Dean picks up an object in the museum about the size and shape of a conch shell. It's a whale's ear bone, she says, but you can't just scoop out the insides to examine it. The bone casing has to be carefully chipped open, and in the case of partially decomposed whales, as many of those that have washed up recently have been, doing so wouldn't be much use. After they're dead three or four days, there's nothing left here. It's mush inside, she says. You look at the flesh of the whale and it smells and it's starting to get jelly-like. You're not going to get anything out of this at all. Part of the conspiracy narrative has suggested that organizations like the Marine Mammal Stranding Center haven't been examining animals thoroughly enough. 
but full necropsies often simply aren't possible. The process typically takes all day, but for one late January stranding in New Jersey, for instance, examiners only had an hour and a half to do their work due to the rising tide. Another New Jersey stranding occurred on Christmas Eve near the Atlantic City boardwalk. It would have taken until after Christmas to put together a team to examine the whale, Dean says, but the town wanted the carcass off their beach before Christmas tourists came into town. So my summarization of what we're supposed to get from that is it would be too hard and would take too long to look for evidence of the impact of seismic activity on whales. It might take a day, we only have an hour and a half sometimes. Even if we look for that evidence, it might not be worth it if the whale had been decomposing for a long time. Well, that would certainly be true in some cases. I'd think with new whales turning up dead week after week, there'd be a chance that at least a few would be fresh enough to have viable samples for you, but I get it. I don't blame Marine Mammal Stranding Center for those cases where you don't have time or the resources to collect the inner ears. I do blame NOAA Fisheries for being extremely deceptive in regularly putting out statements categorically denying that the offshore wind industry has had a role in any of these whale deaths. Saying there's no evidence and leaving it at that is not the whole truth if you as a governmental agency are not providing the resources to gather the evidence. As the story is admitting, the evidence is often probably not even being gathered. It continues, notably MMSC helps examine and collect data from the stranded whales, but they're not the ones who put the pieces together to solve the overall puzzle of what's going on. That's up to federal scientists at NOAA Fisheries. Huh, maybe Time should have done a story analyzing NOAA Fisheries instead. I mean, you waste 90% of this story fixating on people that we never said were causing the problem here, and now at the end you say, well, it's really up to NOAA Fisheries. Yes, we know. That's why we're calling for a federal investigation, so that NOAA Fisheries will open up the books and show the public what we've got. So far they've stonewalled, but Kim Damon Randall, quoted here from NOAA's Fisheries Office of Protected Resources, told New York Public Radio that they're still following the science to figure out what's happening with these whale deaths. But I guess that doesn't involve examining the likely cause. A lot of people like to direct their anger at us. But we're not the people that can provide the answer, says Pagel of MMSC. We're still waiting for the same answers the public is waiting for. To a large extent, though, the outrage appears to stem from a backwards logic. That if no evidence to connect whale deaths to offshore wind emerges, it means the evidence is being hidden on purpose. Not that the proof simply doesn't exist in the first place. <coughs> I contend that NOAA Fisheries is the one using the backwards logic. They're continually parroting the no evidence line in defense of offshore wind without implementing any protocol that would at least ensure a realistic effort to capture any evidence if and when it's available. We understand that it might not be available in some whale deaths, but we're supposed to believe that there's never any chance to take viable inner ear samples? Ever? When you're up to a rate of like 10 carcasses a month washing ashore, you can never be expected to have an opportunity to evaluate whether your seismic activity contributed to these deaths. Well, they're answering questions about the impact of offshore wind with no, when they should be saying we don't know. And they handle offshore wind companies with kid gloves, an approach that is the 180 degree opposite of what they do with fisheries. As we've covered, no entanglements in the better part of two decades and no whale deaths ever from one particular fishery somehow gets interpreted by NOAA fisheries as requiring a cryptic mortality estimate that adds up to several whale deaths. And the people pushing stricter regulations always say, just because we never found proof that you killed a whale doesn't mean it hasn't happened and we never saw it. We've got to assume that you're killing some whales. But in the mid-Atlantic spike of whale deaths, NOAA fisheries operates on the reverse assumption and rather than put into motion an effort to make sure that pertinent evidence is collected. They say, nope, no evidence. These whales all just died suddenly. When we take a rotting carcass and try to find something, it's a little difficult, says Dean. I think that people watch too much television and they think we're NCIS or something. It's just not like that. That's the story, according to Time Magazine. They didn't bother to look into the impacts of any of the major companies facilitating offshore wind development like Orsted, which they've recently added to their list of the top 100 most influential companies, along with others in the offshore wind industry like Equinor and BP. 
Nope. Instead of providing a little investigative journalism into exactly what those companies are doing to the environment, they made this all about the scary persecution of one little mom and pop whale shop by vicious conspiracy theorists. It's been settled. And remember, checking for seismic impact during necropsies is too hard. Case closed. We're all in it together. You know, one earth, one chance, is that, as they say. We can no longer be fossil fools, as we like to say. We need to make this transition. We are going to make this transition. We need the public support. We need the public's understanding of offshore wind. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.